Yes, I've been doing research on um, uh, the history of pornographic film in Sweden. I've been doing research on uh, various kinds of representations of sexuality in mainstream and popular culture. Um, um, uh, but I most recently have been doing like administrative teaching work and what we did, uh, what my department did was a self-assessment of film studies at Linnaeus University. And one of the questions I had to respond to was, uh, how do you integrate the gender perspective in your teaching? And I was, uh, because, uh, <laughs> I was like, okay, what kind of a question is this? Because cinema and media studies, in my opinion, uh, necessarily draws attention to gender and power issues. And I'm really uh, surprised at what you said, Anna, about the student protesting feminism on, on, in, on, in the syllabus, because I think that uh, our students are usually very open and very interested in various uh, discussions of gender, power, diversity, inclusivity, and so on. Um, uh, because you can't really study uh, the history of cinema, for instance, without uh, coming across these various patriarchal structures, power structures, uh, sexual exchanges, uh, uh, constructions of narratives which use various stereotypes and the star system and how the camera works with um, making the woman into the object of desire and so on. You can't really talk about the history of film and other visual media without talking about gender. It's, I don't know how you would do it. I just, and I know that several people do it all the time, but uh, <laughs> I know they do, but I can't really see how they do, how they do it. And uh, I think that some of the things that uh, uh, we work uh, a lot with, and that also the students are very interested in, uh, is the issue of representation, and the issue of representation in front of the camera. What do we see, and the, of course the result, what do we see on the screen, uh, but also behind the camera. Uh, so, um, with an old-fashioned term, ideology permeates so much of um, the film history and the media, cinema and media history that uh, it's almost impossible to talk about without talking about ideology. And in a way, much of film history is a study in patriarchy. Uh, but it's also, and maybe more importantly, uh, it's also a study in the complexity of representation and subversion of this patriarchy. Uh, I'm talking about subtexts, hidden histories, uh, various uh, stars that find uh, uh, audiences that go beyond the uh, immediate, what you would expect. Uh, you have like the femme fatales of film noir and so on. So there is a lot hidden within film history that's not simply supporting and reproducing patriarchal ideology. Uh, there is a polysemy of popular culture, which I find very interesting. Uh, my example that I'm going to use is uh, the rape and revenge genre. Um, the rape and revenge genre is a very interesting genre in that it's very old. You can find the theme of rape and revenge in medieval ballads, for instance. But the interesting thing is that way back when, it was the man who took the revenge. So if a woman was raped, it was the father or the husband who avenged her, uh, the rape. But what happens in the 1970s is that this narrative changes and instead of the man avenging the rape on the woman, the woman herself begins to avenge her rapist. And this is a kind of narrative that's, um, how do you say, it's like everywhere. Uh, so, and it's very, very common. So you can see it as a small theme in various uh, narratives, but you can also see it as films that 
are only about rape and revenge. So for instance, in the Millennium series, you have rape and revenge, uh, both as a small happening in the first of the installments where Lisbeth Salander is raped and she takes out her revenge on her rapist, but you also have the large scale narrative art in which Lisbeth Salander is kind of raped by the system and then she gets her revenge on the system, but in a more figurative sense. So there is a literal uh, rape in the beginning and then it uh, turns into this more figurative narrative arch, arch uh, in the story. Uh, and this draws attention to yet another thing, and that is uh, this uh, idea that entertainment and art is in kind of opposition to each other, because if you look at how the rape and revenge narrative, um, how it um, developed and how it started to, to uh, become popularized, these films are not even, I mean, they may be entertainment, but they're not like the big, glossy, mainstream Hollywood entertainment because they're usually exploitation films, cheap, low-budget films. Uh, and, and they're definitely not really art either. Um, and this, uh, in, in this dichotomy, I think, is problematic because it, uh, how do you say, it stops us from uh, seeing things that we might notice otherwise because we think that entertainment is, you don't really have to interpret, you don't really have to uh, go into it and read it and there are no ambiguities in the narrative. Um, whereas uh, art is complex and you have to really work to understand it. But the interesting thing here is that if you look at the rape and revenge film, it opens up a completely new kind of um, interpretative, a new, a series of uh, interpretative questions that arise when you watch these films, and in particular, if you look at how they are uh, received by the audience. Because this is maybe the statement that I would like to kind of, um, uh, this is like the, the pitch of my talk here. Representation matters, but not always in the way we think it does. Um, and the, I said that the, uh, the narrative of rape and revenge films changed uh, in the 1970s. And there is a, an a, a example. Uh, uh, if you talk about the history of rape and revenge film, you, you usually start with Ingmar Bergman's The Virgin Spring, which is based on a medieval ballad. And then you talk about Wes Craven's Last House on the Left from the early 1970s, which is a remake of Ingmar Bergman's The Virgin Spring. But interestingly, in both of these films, it's the father in Bergman's film and the parents in uh, Wes Craven's film that take the revenge on their raped daughter. Uh, but in uh, 1974, a Swedish film was released called Thriller, A Cruel Picture. And this is as far as I know, the first instance of a film where the woman takes revenge on her rapist. And Thriller is uh, 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 its definitely not art. Uh, it might be entertaining. Uh, it's a very, it has its moment, it has some really, really beautiful moments, but it's made with the explicit intention of making a commercial shit film, uh, the director Boa Vibenio said. And it, it contains, in some versions, it contains hardcore inserts uh, with um, that um, uh, well, the close ups of genitals during uh, sexual intercourse. And also, it is extremely violent. So, the woman who is played by Christina Lindberg, she is uh, abducted and forced into heroin abuse. And heroin was really recent in Sweden at this time. She's forced into heroin abuse and forced into prostitution by this sleazy pimp played by, um, what's his name? Uh, what's his name? Heinz. Heinz. Uh, Heinz Hopf. Heinz Hopf. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, um, and 
Uh, and when she tries to escape, he cuts one of her eyes out with a scalpel. So she walks with, it's of course, I mean, it's made, it's, I mean, it's a special effect. Okay. So, but he does that. And she, so she walks around for the rest of the film with a patch over one of her eyes. And an alternative title in the US was, they call her One Eye. And also Quentin Tarantino was extremely inspired by this when he made Kill Bill. So. Uh, one of Daryl Hannah is uh, in Kill Bill. She walks around with a patch over her eye, and that's a di direct reference to Christina Lindberg's character in Thriller. Um, so now I wandered into this long description of what it's about. <laughs> uh, but in the middle of the film, she decides to take revenge, and uh, and she starts to learn karate, and she learns to shoot, and she learns to drive a car, and then she takes out a gruesome revenge uh, uh, towards the end of the film. Um, and as far as I know, this is the first instance of, of uh, uh, a rape and revenge narrative where the woman takes revenge. Uh, but what is interesting, and why I say that representation matters, is that Thriller is not regarded as a feminist film. Uh, it also has a pretty large cult audience, mainly consisting of men. And the question would be, and the question that arises when you study these kinds of films, and it's uh, been asked by, among others, Carol Clover in her very seminal Men, Women and Chainsaws, is why do young men like to see themselves first behave really badly and then get their asses kicked, usually killed? in gruesome ways, castrated and hung and shot and stabbed in various ways. Uh, and that is, I think, one of the interesting issues here. And there is a, a very famous uh, quote by Stephen King that Carol Clover also uses to, to uh, discuss this. And that is that uh, when Stephen King discusses his book, uh, Carrie, he says that any young man who's had his head dunked in the toilet in high school will recognize himself in Carrie. So, um, um, which would indicate that the people who uh, cheer on and who identify or like root for this uh, character, uh, Christina Lindberg in Thriller, actually are identifying with her rather than with the men who behave like assholes and then are killed. Um, I think um, I'm saying here that what I think is that representation is a very important issue and it does matter a lot, but sometimes maybe it matters in different ways and how it matters is a very complex issue. And that is one of the things that studying film and media history will teach us that representation is very com uh, complex. So, um, I'm just going to end with this question here, what about influence and change? If representation is so complex and so um, uh, unpredictable in how it works, uh, how ca can we come about influence and change? Because that is, of course, what we want to come about, influence and change. Um, and for me, as a scholar, I do research. I'm not really, I don't really, making change is not really my work. If I can make change through the research I'm doing, then I'm very happy with that, of course. But it's like not the main objective of what I do. Um, um, but when I discussed this with uh, Regina, when we talked about this before, we talked about how representation can matter uh, also if, you, if you're thinking about representation and the critique of representation and also how various, uh, various representational uh, or changes in representation can affect an audience to think differently. Uh, what does it then matter, or how important is it that many people are affected by these representations? What does the audience matter? If there is a big audience or if there is a small audience, and if we want uh, change, 
maybe it's the large representations, the ones that reach a large audience, that are the interesting ones. Thank you.